Okay, I think now's a pretty good time uh, to get started. So, um, can everyone see? I'm just making sure I can see the chat here. Can everyone see that switch onto one note? If you if you can just put yeah in the chat. Oh yeah, got two. There we go. Okay, so. Right, as an introduction for myself, um, my name is Jamie Reason. I'm also studying at Durham, Durham and I'm in second year. And uh, last summer I got 100% in my analysis exam. And as a fun fact, I also like surfing, as you can probably see in the background on my room, big poster. And today for our analysis one revision, we're gonna be trying to go, go over quickly some uh, different techniques techniques and methods of proof proofs i'll give you a couple of questions if you find um you can try in your own time but we'll try and speed through that and then get on to the completeness axiom which is where we can put them into practice a bit more um and we'll, we'll try and spend most of our time going over exam questions here um if you're happy to turn on your video please feel free to um i know it's easier to speak to a lot of people if some of them are looking at your back but uh, don't worry if you're shy and uh, as for questions, put them in the chat. I won't be able to see it all the time, um, especially if I'm doing some work-ins, but um, bear arms in, the uh, in this session and he'll try and let me know if there's a lot of the same question. Uh, the slides will be available for you afterwards. I think you might have got an email already. I'm not sure what it will be afterwards. And as always, if you spot a mistake that I've done, which I may well do, just interrupt me, just turn on your mic and interrupt me because uh, otherwise we'll go down a rabbit hole. Um, I think lots of you will already be in the WhatsApp chat, but I'll stay on the screen for a little bit if you want to do scan that um, to join uh, with the questions on this one. Uh, there's, uh, there's quite a few people, um, but I'll try and if there's questions after, just put it in there and I'll try and get to as many as I can. Should, yeah, if you, haven't scanned this yet but want to there'll be the slides afterwards and you might have got an email for this as well um so to start with proof techniques um as like a broad overview of the ones that are available to you kind of at this level um we have direct proofs which you'll all be familiar with um just stepping through the motions and then what you do when you're proving if and only if statements um which is one we'll look at, the starred ones are the ones we're going to look at today. Uh, and also and contrapositive proofs, which I'll come to later, and proof by contradictions, these as well as in induction, but we won't cover that today. Uh, these are all useful to just be aware of so that when you're stuck on a proof, you might think, oh yeah, uh, I can pull that out of my pocket and that does work. Uh, we'll also look at a little bit into epsilon delta proofs, and that'll be something we'll do in later sessions more when we look at uh sequences and series and whatever okay so for if and only if statements uh an if and only if statement is just saying that two two statements are logically equivalent so you'll often see it written like that as uh a if and only if b which just means that a implies b and b implies a and the most important thing with this is to show both directions uh Oftentimes people show A implies B and just says the reverse works. And as many times as the reverse does work, you can just put the implies sign on every line. I think in most cases, if it's a difficult question, at least it's worth doing one direction and doing the other direction then, because uh, often there's small nuances that you don't notice until you go fully through it. And it's the exact same concept with sets. Uh, if you want to show that two sets are equivalent, um, you want to show that one set is a subset of the other and vice versa. So the kind of general method for that is that you assume there's some element in one set and show it's in the other set and then do the same in reverse, unless, unless it's a simple enough set that you can just manipulate. Uh, there will be a couple of questions we're not going to go over today, but I can answer questions about them in the chat and they're on the later slides. Now for a little more interesting one uh, with contrapositive proofs. Um, this is using this useful thing, just use useful um, 
trick that saying A implies B is the exact same as saying that not B implies uh, not A. Um, and just to kind of help yourself get your head around that, if you had, uh, if you have not A, then you have not B in the in, in the first case. Uh, sorry, if you have not B, then you have not A. Um, then there's no way you can have A and B simultaneously. So, or the, uh, yeah, there's no way you can have A and B, not A and B simultaneously. A and not B simultaneously. You see, it's difficult to get your head around, but have a look at it on paper for a second if you're not convinced. Um, and the use in this is that it just means that you can quickly manipulate a proof uh, to make it into something a little bit easier. Um, as an example, we're not going to switch to the one note for this one, but if you wanted to show um, this if and only if statement that m cubed minus n cubed is even, then that's the same as saying m minus n is even. You could do the first case relatively easily, I hope, um, that you'd show the cases whether um, when m minus n is even and show that that implies m cubed minus n cubed is even because cubing numbers is easy in, with the integers. But if you want to show the other direction, instead of assuming the left-hand side, we can just assume the opposite of the right-hand side, which would be uh, m minus n is odd. So... So this bit here is a lot easier to prove than the right direction of this, in my opinion, anyway. Um, you can have a go at this question yourself, but I'm not going to spend too much time on it because well, some of the questions later on are more related to the exam. Um, but one question you might have is, in the last question, even an odd is easy to negate and find the opposite of. Um, so when we're dealing with logical symbols, and I know I said at the start you don't need to use them, I think it's clearer in this case, but feel free to absolutely use for all and there exists instead. Um, if you have a statement saying for all X, we have um, some statement A of X, which is just it, the statement depends on X. Then the opposite of that would be that at least one X doesn't follow that A of X. So the opposite of that would be there exists an X with not A of X. Um, the same works for the opposite way around, essentially. Um, if your statement says that there exists an X where B of X holds, then the opposite would, of that would be that there doesn't exist um, an X with B of X. Or um, another way to say that is just here, for all X, we have not B of X. Um, if you can't quite get your head around these, it's worth uh, drilling them into memory because if you ever need to negate something, it's kind of just this. But the easy way to remember is it, it is you switch the statements to be nots. And when it's not obvious how you do that, if it's got a for rules or a there exists, you just switch them to be the opposite. So combined at the bottom, um, if you have, this is kind of reminiscent of maybe epsilon delta proofs. Um, if you have for all x, there exists a y with c of x, y. The opposite of that would be there exists an X such that for all Y, we have not C of X. And that could be a C of X, Y. Um, but in this case, it's for all Y. So it doesn't even depend on, it doesn't depend on uh, Y at all. And um, yeah, as an example, I'll give you a second to try and negate this statement. And then we'll go through it uh, bit by bit. If you just kind of just want to get the first, the idea of uh, where we'd negate it. I'll give everyone about a couple, couple seconds. Have a look at this. Um, and just for interest, it's this is saying that um, you have that some function is continuous, essentially that within a small interval, it's the same. It's It's less than an epsilon away, sorry. So uh, this would be the answer. And if I can just get my zoom out of the way. Yeah. Um, so if we try and go through this, um, in the first bit, we're changing for all epsilon greater than naught to 
there exists an epsilon greater than naught, just switching it. Uh, the such that I've just added in to make this make sense, but the first one you write it out, you don't need it. And then here we switch the there exists to be a for all and gotten rid of the such that here, um, just like the opposite way around essentially. And again, we've switched the for all to there exists, kept the same interval because um, the this is the condition, this is where X lives essentially, conditional on this. And then this statement here, we've negated um, to have the opposite be that, well, that should be an F of A, I apologize. That should be an F of A there. Um, I didn't notice that, I thought I changed it before, but apparently not. Yeah, that should be an F of A definitely. But all we're saying is that instead of less than epsilon, um, it's greater than or equal to epsilon, and it's worth noticing that you have to have the equal than sign because the opposite of less than isn't greater than. Um, so uh, just so that everyone can understand what's going on with perhaps a statement with less or no logical symbols involved, if you wanted to um, have the contrapositive of this statement. If a quadrilateral is a rectangle, then it has two pairs of parallel sides. Um, that's a kind of then is kind of like your imply sign one way. Then if you wanted to have the contrapositive, it would be uh, you'd flip it around. Then uh, it would be if a quadrilateral does not have two pairs of parallel sides. So the second part, the opposite of the second part, um, then is like your is like your implies. Um, it's not a rectangle, which is just the opposite of the first part. Uh, I hope that makes it clear what we're really doing with the contrapositive. Uh, and now coming on to contradiction and particularly showing uniqueness. If you're ever showed to ask to show that something is unique, um, for example, in the bottom, we're going to have a look at limits. Um, you almost always use a contradiction argument or something which is essentially the same uh, as a contradiction argument, where you assume two distinct objects satisfy certain conditions and show a con contradiction. Uh, all the other slightly different ways that you assume two objects exist that satisfy a condition show that they must be equal, which is essentially the same algebra and apart from a couple of lines. So we're going to do a quick example on showing that the limit of a sequence is unique, uh, which we'll get some practice with kind of epsilons. Uh, shout out if you can't see the one note, by the way. So our argument here would be a contradiction. So we assume what we don't want is we assume the opposite of what we're trying to prove so we assume that two limits exist which is the same as saying that we're going to assume uh for all epsilon is greater than naught this is just the definition of a limit there exists an n such that uh, st is just such that uh for all n greater than this big n uh you might have also so uh known big n as n naught doesn't matter it's just whatever notation you want to use and for our first limit we'll say l1 minus xn xn is our limit xn uh, is our sequence here uh, we're saying that this is less than epsilon which is just the definition that l1 is the limit of xn um, and we're also going to add another limit l2 uh, minus xn is less than epsilon and the reason if you were writing this in an exam or something you probably wouldn't be asked this type of question but if you were you would have to say there exists an n for this one a big n for this one and also say a big m for this one that's m like that um but i'm just taking the maximum essentially here that's that's what you could write and we're gonna do the first line of showing you the first uh, method which is just assume that l1 is different from l2 so we're using a contradiction um, and we can rewrite this uh, as the absolute difference between l1 and l2 
is greater than zero. As if it was zero, that's just the definition of them being the same, essentially, at least with the reals, <laughs> but that's what we're in. So we're gonna construct, we're gonna show that this is not true to show that there's a contradiction. So we're gonna choose a value of epsilon because this is for all epsilon. So any epsilon that doesn't work is what we want. And I'm gonna start off by choosing the difference between the two. And uh, you'll see afterwards, I'm gonna divide by two. Um, but so I'll do it. I'll do a little line here so you can see where we're separating things. I'll, we'll divide by two, but as I think Dirk might have referred to it, it's kind of just cosmetics to make it work out in the end. And this isn't, if you're working this out, you probably wouldn't add this in until the end. And then we can say that L1 minus Xn and add it to Xn minus L2, which we can see is exactly the same as L2 minus Xn because we've got the absolute value. And using the triangle inequality, this is less than, oh, oh we want, uh, sorry. Using the triangle inequality, this is equal to, or sorry, less than, uh, we, we're going to do, that's not, that shouldn't be an equals there. But we, we want to combine these together, so that the XNs will cancel, which is what we wanted. And that is less than or equal to this. Um, just if you, just to restate the triangle inequality, it will be, you should be, from, well, you might be familiar with it, I'm guessing. Oh yeah, so with our assumption is that uh, this, sorry, that's the wrong way around. So I should, our assumption is that this is less than or equal to L1 minus L2. That is, was awful. L1 minus L2 over two. Um, and then this implies that this is less than L1 minus L2 over two since um, this here is less than or equal to this. That's the right way around, apologies. And then our, our the line we are forced to conclude is that the difference between, I don't know why I wrote an N there, that's not a two. The difference between L1 and L2 is less than half the difference between L1 and L2. And, um, this is where you can stop because this is like saying some positive number a is less than a over two, which is absolute nonsense. So we say contradiction. And so our above bit here is, uh, it's not wrong, sorry, it leads to a contradiction. So we can say that the one bit which we ha will have to change is that L1 is not equal to L2 because we can certainly, we, we know that the first part is true. We can have a limit. Um, th there does exist a sequence such that there's a limit, um, but this part is not true. So the final line you want to write is, hence L1 equals L2. And that's where you've shown it took a lot longer than I expected, but we'll try and, does anyone have any, why do we say it's less than, is that something I correct? Why do we say it's, sorry, let me just read this chat. Why do we say it's less than the absolute? Is that an L1 minus L2 over two? Is that on uh, this line here? Is that what you're asking where this comes from? Um, you know, it's the bit above that. You know, where we've done um, the absolute of L1 take X. Oh, he, here? Yeah, that bit, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. 
Um, so in our assumption bit at the beginning, we've assumed that, um, where is it? We've assumed that both of them are less than epsilon. And actually, uh, thank you for picking that up because that should be, that should be a um, two L one over two times two. And we can get rid of that two then. And you just can't say A is less than A. That's that's what we should have. Thanks for picking that. Thanks for picking that up. Um, yeah, so we're, our assumption is that both of these limits are less than epsilon. So we've chosen, and this is for any epsilon we can choose. Um, so we've just picked this particular epsilon because this particular epsilon leads to something going wrong. So obviously this line is nonsense, but that's kind of the point. We want to make it nonsense so that we can show that the above is also wrong. Um, but yeah, you're completely right that there should be a two there because we're adding two of them. So it's that this is less than epsilon and also this is less than epsilon. Um, I got carried away with the over two, I think, but thanks for picking up on that. No other questions? Um, okay. So now there are a couple of questions that before we go on to the completeness axiom that i want to give people a chance to um well in your free in your own time afterwards if you wanted to have practice on showing equivalence of sets there's this one um i've gone through um you might have a different different solution to me but if you post it in the whatsapp chat uh, even me or i'm sure someone else if they see it um can check whether it's right and Likewise for the contrapositive example, which I think is particularly useful because um, there's a couple of ways to show this, but if you perhaps do it the way that feels most intuitive and then try and do it um, using a contrapositive, you might see that the contrapositive kind of comes more naturally, um, but it's something you might want to play around with yourself. Uh, so lovely. Um, if, there, if I didn't make any other mistakes in the slides before, We'll go on to the completeness axiom, which is, uh, I would expect most likely going to come up on your exam, certainly in the one in summer, if not the collection. Um, and this is the completeness axiom is just stating is purely this. It's that every non-empty set uh, subset of R, which is bounded above, has a supremum. And you could this implies that if it's bounded below, it has an infimum as well which is always saying is that if, um, if a set is below a certain number, so say if you can, if it's less than 10, then we're not saying that 10 is the supremum, but there is some number which is the best maximum, which is that no other maximum is better. Um, so as a recap, the supremum is the least upper bound or the best upper bound, and the infimum is the maximum lower bound uh, or the, the max or the best lower bound, uh, which we're saying if we have a set that we, uh, if we have a set that we can draw reels on a vertical line and our set kind of is dotted around here, we can say it's bounded above by here and bounded below by here. All we're saying is that if that's true, then there is a supremum and there is an infimum that lies somewhere. And I think this might be best shown how it's useful in a couple of examples. So the first one we'll look at is uh, this question, um, which is kind of the general the general way that these are written out. Ooh. Can everyone see my, uh, interrupt me if you can't hear, if you can't see the one though. Um, but yeah, we're gonna work through this example, which is that we wanna find the infimum and supremum of this set. Obviously, if it tends to infinity um, in either direction, then it's not going to have one or the other. Uh, but that's what we're going to find out. So we can take um, our conditions are that they're both natural numbers, so uh, positive. And we can, what we want to uh, do is bound it between two numbers first of all and then test whether those bounds can be the infimum or supremum and if they're not try and bind, bound them tighter 
so if we write oh, i'll go to a go to a blue i think it's easiest to read if we write out one element of our set we want to bound this above and below so to bound it above we want we can see that um well firstly we kind of want to test if we if we make m really dominant and forget about m then we we're essentially writing out 2m over m because the ends are going to be negligible which gives us an idea that two is going to be uh, the supremum and in the other direction if we pretend if we let n get arbitrarily big then the m's are going to be negligible and we're going to be left with n over 3n so uh, two is our supremum and a third is our infimum we haven't proved that at all um, but this is kind of where we're going to head for so if we want to make two as our supremum we've got a 2m up here and we want something bigger so we can certainly add a 6n on because it's positive if it's negative can't necessarily do this but m plus 3n uh oops sorry didn't mean to do that and this just cancels out as two and doing the same for the lower bound we can add something to the denominator to make it smaller so we're going to add a 5m so we have 6m plus 3n and that's equal to a third. So we a third and two are certainly bounds now, but we want to show that they are the best lower and upper bounds respectively. So for the infimum, which we'll start with, we're gonna um, well, the way the way to show that something is the best upper bound or lower bound is to either find a, a sequence which tends to it or show that um, by a contradiction argument that if you had another one, it's it would lead to a contradiction. If you had a better upper bound in this case or lower bound, sorry, it would lead to a contradiction. So we're going to do the first option and we're going to fix M equals to three, uh, which should become more transparent later on. So we'll have um, 2m plus n over m plus 3n. And if I just check that's yeah, that will be equal to 6 plus n over 3 plus 3n um, minus a third, because we've got the 6. Uh, sorry, where have I, what have I done here? Uh, I think we just want to leave it as that and then look at uh, what it is without. Oh, yeah, okay. And then we consider if we set this equal to, say, xn. Um, and if you haven't seen this notation, it's just that xn is defined to be this. Then we'll have the uh, xn is in our set, which we haven't actually named. So I'll name it now to be x. So xn is in our set of the x's. And we have that uh, xn minus a third, we'll put it in absolute value, is equal to 6 plus n over 3 plus 3n minus a third, which is equal to uh, 6 plus n minus 1 minus n, and this is where the n's will cancel, over uh, 3 plus 3n. And that gives us uh, 5 thirds times 1 over n plus 1. And clearly this tends to 0 as n tends to infinity. Uh, if you wanted to justify that, you can just put cult. I think everyone's familiar with cult. And so since uh, this tends to zero and xn is in x, um, we 
we have this 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 essentially shows that xn is uh, this shows that one third is the infimum because it's the best lower bound. Uh, if you wanted to go through, kind of justifying it with the second method using this, then we can have that if uh, little c is greater than a third, and the notation here is uh, c is some possible lower bound, and big C is some possible uh, upper bound. So. This just just to make it clear, this bit above is perfectly valid in your argument to just leave out this. But I think it's worth going over this. There's lots of the questions and the problem sheets use this method as well. So if C is greater than a third, uh, is I probably should stick with the same color, is a lower bound, um, then we can choose an n with five thirds times one over n plus one being less than c minus a third and uh, because c is greater than a third this is greater than zero um, which is kind of like um, when we're talking about limits it's kind of like our epsilon so because we can do or at least it's positive the, the key bit is here that it's positive um, and because I'll go with the epsilon because I think that's more confusing than it helps. Um, and because um, because this is positive, we can then have that. Uh, oh, by Archimedes, I think is what you would reference it with. Um, sorry. Oh yeah, we're choosing this by Archimedes. Yeah, um, which you probably don't have to specify, write it out. Um, and then all we'd have is the six plus N over three plus three N is less than said C, which is to say that C is not a lower bound. And hence we can have what we were looking for that the infimum of our set X is equal to a third. Um, let me get the chat to see that everyone followed. I hope everyone followed that bit. Um, it might become more clear when going through this supremum. So to get to this supremum, we're gonna uh, just remind ourselves up at the top that we wanna show this is, uh, has a supremum of two. So we'll write that out again. Uh, 2m plus n over, so what was it? m plus 3n. Uh, we have that it's less than or equal to 2. We already showed that, um, but we want to show that's the best upper bound. And for this, um, because if you think in our initial reasoning, we said that if n is fixed and m gets arbitrarily large, then we can forget about the n. That's how we got to this two here. So we just want to do the same kind of thing, just fix uh, n equals to one. So something that isn't too annoying, uh, nice and small. And um, what we can write out is that two minus two m plus, uh, we're substituting the n for one over m plus, substitute the n for one again, three. Uh, if we write this out, we'll get uh, 2m plus 6. Let me know if I've done any of this wrong. 2m plus 6 minus 2m minus 1 over m plus 3, which um, we can cancel these, and we just get 5 over m plus 3. Oh, um, the reason why we can't pick n to be 0 0.5 is because initially we um, specified that it's a natural number. So it has to be one, two, three or whatever. Um, but you could, you could potentially choose n to be equal to two or something. Um, and yeah, you could, you could choose n to be really anything you want because the key bit is that you just have a different sequence here, but still one that tends to zero. So, you know, if you s substitute that for two, 
and then that would be six. Um, these two would still cancel. So we'd have a two here and a six here, and you'd end up with um, four. You'd end up with four over m plus six. I think if you went too high, you're going to cancel out with this uh, six. If I'm right. Oh no, but you you wouldn't you sorry that's not right because the the fraction on this side would be different, but it would be something similar to that. Um, yeah, and you do have complete freedom to choose your m your n even, uh, because as long as it's fixed, then your m can make it can be much larger and make it negligible, uh, which is what we want. So, um, carrying on as this being our sequence, if everyone agrees. Um, we can say that if we had add, um, an upper bound that was less than two, um, then we want to choose an M with five over M plus three being, uh, sorry, uh, so this, this is our, xn we want this to be less than two minus the c um, which um, we can do because um, xn tends to zero would be the quick way to write it or by archimedes or whatever you want to say so um, c is greater than uh, c is less than two so this is greater than zero which means we can do it and with this logic, we'd have that. Um, I'll go through this and then I'll come back to that question in the chat. Um, then we'd have that C is less than 2m plus 1 over m plus 3, um, which is a contradiction. And here you ask, I don't get how by showing that xn tends to 0 as n tends to infinity. And xn is an element of x, why we have the inf of x to be a third. So this is a uh, up for the inf. So um, are you asking with like you are you asking that you understand if we do the bottom bit, uh, if we choose the little c and show that that doesn't work, but you don't understand why it works without justifying it? Is that your question or? I'll take that as to be. Um, essentially, we're saying that um, if we have if we have our set um, lying somewhere on the reals, then if we have a sequence that uh, tends to a limit down here that we've shown that is a lower bound, then um, to show we we've already shown it's a lower bound, but to show that it's the best lower bound. We want to show that there's no lower bound we can pick that's bigger that will work as a lower bound still. And because we have a sequence tending to this, it means that if we make n big enough, we can um, get as close to this lower bound as we want. So, for example, if this um, if this little c as we've called it was wasn't uh how can i phrase it if this little c was a bigger upper bound a bigger lower bound then no values can be less than it um but in this case by the properties of like a, a sequence tending to a limit we can get as close to here as we want so whatever this whatever this little c is we can go we can go less than it um and still be in our set which means that c is not a lower bound to that set and that just comes back to we've shown that one third is a lower bound and now we've shown any other lower bound that's bigger doesn't work so uh, one third must be the best upper bound lower bound sorry I'm muddling my words uh, does that make sense I'll, I'll carry on with this and then um, see if put in the chat if you're still confused with it um so okay great um so we were doing the same reasoning in this part um for the supremum except the opposite way around essentially we have our big c 
um, we've shown that if our big C is less than two or upper, better upper bound than two, we've shown that we can find an M such that uh, we have an, this is an element of our X um, and it's greater than this big C, which is our contradiction. And since two is an upper bound and it's the best upper bound, we can conclude that the, oh, sorry, not the infimum, the supremum of X is equal to two, which uh, finishes this question up nicely. Um, now's the time to put in the chat if anyone was confused with some of that. You can fix the values. Okay, so how can we can fix the values of M and N? Um, in our, in our um, set, uh, this was kind of why I chose this question is because we have two values. Um, if we have, a, we, we're, we're constructing a sequence um, here, xn, I can't remember. Okay, xn is equal to, we, we set m to be equal to three um, over, this is what our xn was, and we did that by fixing the m value. This is because our constraint on the n and m is that they're both natural numbers. So as long as we um, stick to that, we're completely fine. And although this Xn doesn't cover all of the values in this set, it is in, it's like a, um, all the values of this is a subset of this X essentially. So showing that this, showing that this here is bounded wouldn't show that this big set is bounded, but showing that finding a sequence with one of the values fixed still is a sequence inside our larger set. Um, which was, yeah, that's a good question. Does that make sense? It's essentially that we're, we're allowed to make our restrict, or we're allowed to make our conditions stricter, but we're not allowed, yeah, okay, good. We're allowed to make our conditions stricter for finding a sequence, not, but not a bound. Um, so next question I wanted to do, Next question I wanted to look at was one with functions, um, which is essentially the same kind of thing, um, except our function in this case, uh, yeah, if we switch over to one, that's gonna be easiest. Our function in this case, our set, sorry, our big set that we were calling X in the last um, case is, um, the image space of this function, or it's uh, all the values of f of x, um, such that x is in the original domain, or I think, um, yeah, it's uh, real, so such that x is a real number. And um, this, once we've put it into this case, uh, we're essentially just back at the exact same as the last, or the exact same style, sorry, not the exact same question, exact same style as the last question, except our X is any real number. But it's still useful to deal with these functions instead to just kind of make things uh, simpler to deal with. I suppose the notation, it should make sense when we're going through them. Um, so we wanna look at X over one plus mod X. And we can already, we can already spot uh, um, just as something to notice that uh, uh, if we, I'll do these kind of absolute values, the started lines, just so you understand, we're just considering this as an observation, not that this is in the set. Um, mod X is less than one plus mod X because uh, we're taking absolute value. Well, they, it, we don't need to take absolute values either side um, anyway it's just this this holds um so the denominator is greater than the numerator in absolute size so we'd kind of suspect that we should be able to bound this between uh well between because we've done absolute values it would be uh zero and one which would mean 
the x over one plus mod x, I, I didn't mean to draw that line, sorry, um, is bounded between one and minus one, um, which is what we want to spot. And um, alternative way to write that would be that the absolute value of f of x, let's not make that clearer, the absolute value of f of x is uh, less than or equal to one. Um, just to see this, if you made x uh, really negatively large, then it would be like, um, ne never write this in exam, by the way, uh, but <laughs> if you, um, you'd have kind of like negative infinity over one plus the absolute value of negative infinity, which would be that, uh, the one would just get absorbed and you'd cancel out. Uh, doing things like this is absolutely fine to get your head around what the infimum and supremum should be, and then you just have to prove it. Um, and yeah, for large, it would be infinity plus, uh, infinity over one plus infinity, and you'd get one. So that should kind of convince you that this is what we're trying to show. And if, but the problem we have is that this absolute value of the X here. So we can just consider our two cases of it being positive and negative separately. And I should note for completeness, you might want to say um, when X is equal to zero, but it's just zero. So it's in the middle of these and we're not interested in it. Um, but in a complete answer, you would consider that as well. But first of all, we'll look at for X is greater to the naught. Uh, we'd have that f of x is equal to x over 1 plus, and then we can get rid of the absolute value sign, um, as we're positive anyway. And uh, we want to show that this is, what we want to show is that this is some, some, like some amount less than 1, as 1 is our upper bound. So it's 1 minus something which tends to 0 is kind of what we want to show. So we can rewrite this as kind of, one plus x minus one on the top. So we'd have one minus one over one plus x. Um, I hope everyone follows with that. And um, instead of using our uh, notation with little c and big C, I'm just going to say uh, for large x, one over one plus x. I haven't even named this x. Uh, a sequence because our x's are um, continuous and I could take x to be an integer but we don't need to in this case so it kind of just makes it more complicated um, but for large x this tends to zero and so um, since one is an upper bound that we've shown before we have that there's some value in the set which is uh, infinitesimally close to one and this is enough justification, in my opinion, uh, that we can say uh, this implies the soup of f, which is how you'd write it, um, is equal to one. Um, and to think of this maybe in terms of the integers that we were looking at before, you could let xn be a sequence one over one plus n, where n gets large and do the big C proof. But this is all you need to write down. It'll save you a lot of time. Um, so just going through the same motions for negative x. Um, by the way, if we've shown that it's bounded and we only consider us the positive x to show that the infimum and supremum are, in fact, what we thought they were, that's completely fine. But um, as long as we can show that it's bounded everywhere. Um, but in this case, we do need to look at negative x to show this, the infimum. So if we look at for x less than zero, um, we write our, our f of x as before, but it will be slightly different. We'll have x over 1 minus x. And in the same fashion as above, where we had um, 1 minus a small amount, we're going to do minus 1 plus a small amount. Um, and that will be, if I'm not this, 1 over 1 minus x. Um, that is, yeah, one minus X plus, 
yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, I just think I'm just confusing myself. Um, and then um, this is almost identical to this case because x is negative instead of positive. So we have uh, since um, we can take minus one plus one over one minus x tends to minus one as x tends to negative infinity this time. Um, that means that minus one must be the best lower bound. Or if it is a lower bound, it's the best one. And we already showed that it is. So we have that the infimum of f is equal to minus one. And that will complete the that completes the proof for that question. And we're doing all right on time so far. So this comes to an exam question. Let me just find my notes on it. This was actually one that I did in the summer. Oh, that was this was on my paper. So this should be, this should be fun to go through, I say. Um, and it's the same kind of thing as same kind of thing as the previous questions, but I'd argue it's a little more difficult. And um, I actually think since these are in person exams this year, this should be of a harder difficulty than you'd be expected to produce in an exam. So if you're looking at this, not wondering wondering how to do it, don't panic. Um, but I still think it's useful to practice with difficult questions and then the easy ones uh make it easy make make uh, make sense a lot quicker um but yeah you don't you're not expected to necessarily be able to produce a question like this in in the time of a collection exam at all so i think i probably spent far more time than i'd be willing to admit on this question last summer um uh, so if we get started on it, um, we want to show, we want to find what this is bounded between in first or get an idea of what it is bounded between. And the key bit here is that we have this condition that m is less than or equal to 2n. Um, so our 2n is our dominant thing. And you might be able to notice you can kind of um, rewrite this as like 3 times 2n squared m. And you could write this as 2n cubed. And you can write this as 3 times 2n m squared and kind of factorize out the 2n. So we can just deal with this 2n as some even number, which um, is greater than or equal to m, um, which is where we'll go down. But um, yeah, I think we'll go straight away as it's kind of difficult to see at this stage what it might be bounded between. Um, but it would, yeah, it took me a while to notice this anyway. But um, to first notice, sorry, my chair's a bit broken. To first notice, um, what we're going to do here you just have to play around with them a bit um and i'm gonna well, all i'm gonna do is i'm gonna write m in a different way i'm gonna write n as 2n minus some uh some uh, natural number or i suppose where k is an element of n naught natural numbers including naught because it's less than or equal or maybe it's simpler if I write k is greater than or equal to naught. That probably is. And you can kind of just uh, kind of just suggest that k is an integer. Um, and where we're headed is that we want to show that this set is bounded above by one. And um, you'll see because if I treat this 2n as something here, then we kind of have a, if our n's and m are equal, then we have one of this 2n cubed, whatever it is, we have, if m is 2n, we'd have one here and three here. And on the top, we'd have one here 
uh, and three here. So we'd have, it would be like four over four, which is one. So that's kind of where that intuition might come from. Um, but let's, um, but you might have tried showing it's less than or equal to a half, first of all, and fail. And uh, this is kind of the, the this is just some, <laughs> I suppose, some, something that's always comes up in analysis is that you'll try one way or fail and you'll eventually try the right way. Um, but yeah, I should probably stress again, this is harder than what you'll come across in the collection exams. It's just useful to see, uh, see some more difficult questions. Um, so we want to, I'll write it out as our goal um, in red, maybe. We, oh, we want to show um, that our set M is bounded, sorry, I'm hand right in, bounded above by one. Um, so we're going to, we have this way written out. So again, we're going to use a contradiction argument and we're going to assume that there exists. Um, I'll use this, uh, maybe this as well, that there exists uh, K following our conditions uh, that we put on it such that, and then if I rewrite it out, uh, M cubed plus 12 n squared m over 8 n cubed plus 6 n m squared is greater than or equal to one. Or actually, uh, no, I don't want greater than or equal to because I haven't said the problem would be an equal to one. Um, greater than one. Um, and if we rewrite the m in terms as we wrote before, as 2 n minus k. Okay, is greater than or equal to naught. Um, I'm just gonna. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna move this section here over to this side because it's it's um it's positive because uh they're natural numbers. So I don't have any problems with inequality. So that's the same as if I rewrite the m as two n minus k cubed plus twelve n squared times two n minus k being greater than eight n cubed plus six n. 2m minus k squared. Um, I'm just checking. No, we can see that it's right. Yeah, and maybe, um, I don't know if it's worth going through all of this, if someone, because it, it, it's the algebra, and I think most of you will be all right expanding this and looking at the algebra, but we're left with minus k cubed plus 6k squared n minus 24kn squared plus 32 n cubed being greater than 6k squared n minus 2k, oh, 24, sorry. Uh, you might be able to spot what's coming up. Minus 24k n squared plus 32 n cubed. And uh, we can just cancel from both sides, this, 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 and this. And we're left to say, uh, we're left to say that uh, minus k cubed is greater than naught. Um, well, maybe to write it in either more blatant terms, k is less than zero, but since k is greater than or equal to zero, or k cubed is less than zero, but since k, k is greater than or equal to zero, this means this is a contradiction. So we, so that means that our above statement here must be wrong but we know that um the, this condition is completely fine because it's true that m is less than or equal to n so it's this which we concluded is false and the opposite of that is that one is an upper bound so we successfully have one is an upper bound of m which is a good place to be um, now we want to show, uh, what's the best way to do? Yeah, now we want to show that it's the best upper bound. And um, 
for this there's a couple of ways um but like i hinted at before when m is equal to 2n we got what we wanted we got the four over four essentially so since um since in the, in this case uh, the supremum is the maximum and it's achieved um so just to write that out uh, yeah just to write that out it would be if we oh, maybe i'll use blue if we take m is equal to 2n um this is just going to be some element of the set and equally we could choose m to be seven and oh that, that's actually one example of one m to be eight and n is equal to four uh that's absolutely fine as well but leaving it like this happens to cancel out uh, is someone is someone unmute, unmute, unmuted or not i'm not sure um but yeah um we if if the this is true then we have the m cubed plus uh 12 n squared m which i'm just uh, over eight n cubed plus six n m squared i copied off my notes so i'm going to check that it is yeah we're, we just got it from there um this which would be an element of our set is equal to Uh, 2n cubed plus um, 3 times 2n squared. I just absorbed the uh, 2 into the n. Uh, into the, uh, I, I absorbed the 4 into the n squared, essentially. Um, ooh, I wanted to get rid of the m's. So, and then we have 2n again. And on the bottom, we'd have 2n cubed plus 3 times 2n times 2n squared. And we can see the numerator and denominator are exactly the same. So we have 1. So 1 is an element of m, and 1 is an upper bound. Uh, my zoom chat's in the way. And 1 is an upper bound. So we have the uh, right in red actually is this is we have that the supremum of m is equal to one, which also happens to be the maximum in this case, which is nice. And uh, I don't think the same I don't think we have the minimum for um, when we get to the infimum. But we're going to come back up and try and figure out what we're going to try and prove to be the, we've already shown this bit, we're going to try and see what we could choose to be the um, infimum. And although M is restricted on N, if we fix M, sorry, that's, I'm sure that's not, M is restricted to be less than or equal to 2N, but we can fix the M and the the n can get as large as it wants. Um, just roll that out so you can understand the difference between m and n's. Um, so if we see here um, that we have, um, firstly, that they're in the natural numbers. So we can't simply pick m to be 0 and get uh, 0 plus 0 over 8n cubed or whatever. Uh, although that would be nice, but um, we have that it is definitely uh, positive or non-negative at least because they're all positive numbers. So we at least have this lower bound and to motivate why that's our infimum and why nothing else is a better lower bound. If we uh, fix M to be some number, whatever it is, um, we're going to choose one that happens Happens to work out nicely, but if we fixed M, then um, we'd have our essentially we'd have our n cubed on the bottom. Uh, right there, we'd have an n cubed on the bottom and a squared on the top as our highest terms, which means that n will be dominant on the bottom, and we can make n as big as we want, and so we can make this whole thing ten to zero, or we can get close to be zero being 
in the set. Um, although we won't actually get zero. Um, may as well write it as we know it. Um, yeah. So we just want to show that now. I don't know how I give myself a We'll like to read what I'm doing. Um, we already said that, just to reiterate, since m and n greater than zero, uh, I'll rewrite it, m cubed plus 12 n squared m over eight n cubed plus six n m is uh, greater than zero, lower bound. And we want to prove that there's a contradiction. Now, um, we could go for the uh, limit technique again, but I'm gonna go back to the little c, just so you kind of get a get a, a taste for what it's like doing both methods. So here, if we assume, uh, I'll just actually say that we're doing a contradiction argument. So I did say we'd get practice with some of these in the later questions, which is why I didn't spend too much time practicing them. But if we assume that we have a little c greater than the wall, um, is a lower bound, which is just to say that that is greater than little c. Uh, but I'll get rid of there for now. Um, then if we fix or take uh, m equals to one, which is fine, because like I said on the last question, uh, we're just narrowing down our options of things in the set, uh, which is absolutely fine uh, because we're showing that it's not a lower bound. If we were showing that it is a lower bound, we couldn't, we couldn't narrow down our options, uh, but this is completely fine. We fix m to be equal to one. And then we have, um, I am going to call it xn in this case as our limit, as our uh, sequence. Our xn would be equal to uh, one cubed, so one plus 12 n squared one, so 12 n squared over eight n cubed plus six n, um, which is most definitely an element of m because it's the, it, it doesn't make to reiterate this doesn't isn't this all of these xn's don't make up all of the values in m it's just that it's a subset essentially or not it's an element in it yeah that's the best way to say it um and if we want to we want to show that the limit or as n tends to infinity or as n gets large of our xn that is i'll make sure i write it out um we're going to use cult, but I think the best way to do it, or how you've been shown perhaps, is um, yeah, uh, to divide by the n cubed. So one over n cubed plus twelve over n, because the n squared cancels out two of them, and then you just have an eight plus six over n squared. And that would be equal to zero by cult, um, just because the denominator is still non-zero, so that's fine. And this this is enough. Like I said in the last question, this is enough that you have a sequence tending to the lower bound. But if you want to do write out and it's all explore, you'd say that this implies that there exists um, a big N such that uh, for all little n beyond that value, we have the value of xn is less than epsilon, which we can just choose to be our little c, um, which means that not, um, okay, yeah, um, which means that we have, um, Whatever little c we choose, there's still there's still going to be a value in the set which is um, less than it, and then this implies that the infimum of m is equal to zero. And I've had a question asking why we didn't use this method for the supremum. Um, the difference is that if we have our set here between uh, zero and one, 
we have a value which is at uh, one, um, which takes it, and we know that this set is, we, 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 we know that this set is bounded in between these values, but since we do have a value at one, there can't be any better bound. Um, if you found the bound that is the maximum that you find the value that it takes, you've shown uh, it's the best one. Uh, in this case, we might have we might have values dotted all around forever. Um, in this case, we found a sequence which gets progressively closer to zero, but zero is never actually reached, which is kind of um, what we're talking about with infimum and supremum instead of minimum and maximum. We never zero is not the minimum um there is no minimum to this set it doesn't make sense to talk about it it's like saying what's the minimum of one over n where n is positive um it's just that in this case we couldn't say oh there is a value at zero we have to instead say oh if we did have a better upper bound i can still find a value that means that it isn't actually a sorry i meant to say lower bound that it means it isn't actually a lower bound um so that's why we had to do the method for this case because the minimum isn't achieved, but we still want to show that it is the infimum. Uh, I hope that makes sense. Whoever was that that asked the question. Um, okay, so why can we choose epsilon to be c in this case? Um, when we're talking about the limit of a function, the way it's written is oh, that's not the way it's written is for all epsilon greater than or naught, there exists an n, uh, technically greater than or equal to naught, no, uh, such that um, for all n greater than or equal to big N, we have, um, we have the limit xn minus the limit is epsilon and we so in this case um our limit was zero so we had xn is less than epsilon and the bit precisely you're asking is it's for all epsilon greater than naught so we can choose we can choose uh, we could have chosen epsilon to be uh 10 which would have been rather useless and we could have fixed it to be something like one over a thousand which would have been similarly useless because we couldn't show that it um wasn't anything smaller than that, but still greater than one. Um, but precisely we're saying whatever we do choose, because it's greater than naught, we, we can sub it into this. If we were trying to use this method, if we had a sequence tending to zero, um, if we had a sequence tending to zero where our lower bound was actually minus one, it wouldn't work. Um, but if, for example, you had, you had, it was 10, say if it was 10, Xn, was greater than or equal to two, and you had um, xn minus, yeah, minus two is less than epsilon, then uh, um, you could get rid of the, because, because of this inequality, you can get rid of the absolute values and you'd have xn minus two is less than epsilon, which means xn is less than epsilon plus two, and then we would set that to be our c. Um, which would be anything greater than two, if that makes sense. Uh, but yeah, to answer your question, it's just because it's for all epsilon that's positive. Um, it looks like we have got a bit more time to go over a couple more questions, which is nice. Um, if I just check. Yeah. Um, oh, I've gone back somehow. I'm sorry. Um, I think maybe doing another exam question if we've got the time would be nice. So we'll look at uh, 2020 question three. And, uh, should be the right question. Yeah. Okay. So um, this is one that, yeah, we haven't done this one and it's, in terms of a single n, so it's nice and simple. And this is this is more like uh, an exam question you'll see in your paper. Um, so first of all, we want to do the 
Wiccans for the Supremum. And I'm just trying to figure out uh, what it is. Um, because it's only polynomials top and bottom, uh, we can use the same kind of argument before um, that since um, we've got the only as n gets really large, the squared's term are going to dominate. And so it's going to be one over one, which kind of makes us think um, this would be a good upper bound. Um, the difficulty comes in that for small n, and it might not be true, but luckily this minus four over n helps us out because this is at least four, which means that this is at least, uh, that this bit here is at most minus one, um, which means it's going to be less than, which means that the denominator is bigger. So we do have that it's, we do have what is an upper bound, but just to uh, show it, in writing, we'd have that since three minus four n is less than or equal to one. Um, sorry, before we carry on, I just kind of like to go over again. When I'm, uh, what I'm doing, saying, oh, these are dom dominating um, when for n large and for n small, we can this helps us out. This is really what you want to look at before. If you try diving straight into showing something, you'll just be staring at a blank page. Um, you kind of got to figure out what you think the supremum and infimum are before you attempt it just intuitively and um if you got it wrong uh, that's fine your your workings will probably show you that it's wrong at some point you just might have wasted a couple minutes um but yeah just play around with it until you kind of spot what's going on um but yeah carrying on we have the n squared minus 4n plus 3 uh just this bit here over n squared plus 1 is less than or equal to just uh, subbing this in n squared plus one over n squared plus one is what I'm doing, which is one. So uh, one is definitely an upper bound. And now if we, we want to use our big C notation again, because uh, I've chosen to use it in this one. And if we assume that we have a big C uh, or an upper bound that's less than one, uh, then this implies uh, zero is less than one minus big C. Uh, just to rewrite it, um, because um, like I said on the last question we did, um, we're not looking at zero, so we might have to write it a bit differently. Um, but here we have, uh, this is our assumption that we want to prove is wrong. Right, uh, again, contradiction argument. If anyone can read that, I hope you can. Uh, it's a little one-sided as well, but um, this is our assumption that we want to show is wrong. Then from this assumption, we have the n squared minus 4n plus 3 over n squared plus 1, which is just an element of our set. What do we call it? Okay, we call it x. An element of our set. We have that that is, we know that this is greater than or equal to um, n squared uh, plus 3. I'll just reorganize this. Uh, sorry, do I want to? Just looking what I've done. Okay, yeah, no, this is fine. Um, we don't need to do a greater than or equal. Why is it? Why is it one and not minus one for three minus four n? Oh, um, good point. Uh, this is absolutely true that this is less than minus one but minus one is less than one. So um, we have this, oh, sorry, that is a bit confusing. Yeah, um, this is true, but if we subbed it in, we'd have n squared minus one over n squared plus one. And then we just have to say that that's less than or equal to one, uh, which you completely could do. Uh, there was just a question, I think it was a private question for people who didn't see it, it was why, why isn't this a minus one? Um, 
yeah so i kind of jumped a step there maybe uh should have justified that more but writing this out maybe would be the best way i just it just saved me a step later on um but it is true it is true that it is min uh, minus one works um and back to where we were um this one um what are we looking at sorry uh we can write this as um we wanted to show that one is the upper bound so we're going to do one minus some sequence where xn tends to zero that's kind of the idea of it and xn is positive uh, if we can show that we're, we're fine so we can rewrite this as um one minus 4n over n squared plus three sorry greater than or equal to i, I did need that because it's greater than or equal to if we, we're kind of just making this uh three like this goes to a one um i'll rewrite yeah i'll write it out just in case that's not clear we're saying this is greater than or equal to n squared plus one minus four n over n squared plus one um and i don't know why i suddenly started writing on an angle uh which is um because we've just made the denominator smaller so we're fine uh, which is one minus four n over n squared plus one and so we have our values are all greater than this so our reasoning is if we have a if we have an upper bound or if we have something we think might be an upper bound but this is greater than it then this is also greater than it so it's not an upper bound for our sequence um for our for our uh set um and then we have this is greater than or equal to one minus 4n over n squared um, again because i've because it's a minus i can make the denominator smaller and that is just one minus four over n and then uh then we with our assumption at the beginning we'd have that our big c is greater than or equal to one minus uh four over n which is the same as saying uh, uh, yeah, zero minus, which is less than or equal to one minus big C as we wrote up at the beginning here. Uh, same as saying that that is uh, less than or equal to four over uh, N and whatever C we choose, there exists an N such that that isn't true by Archimedes. And then since we have that there can't be any better upper bound than one, and one is an upper bound, this implies the supremum is, the supremum of our set is one. And I might go a little bit quicker on the infimum, so we have some time at the end. Um, for the infimum, I'm going to copy n squared minus four. And minus four n plus three over n squared plus one was it yeah um it helps to write out a couple of values to kind of um see what's happening so if for n equals one um i'm not going to write out the full thing each time i'm just going to say n equals one we have zero n equals two we have minus a fifth n equals three we have minus a tenth um n equals four we have uh three over 17 so we kind of start at zero uh go lower and then start going upwards and um this is what's going to be useful for us uh because we've already looked at these values so we can consider uh n is greater than or equal to four only and then look at these at the end and for n is greater than or equal to four. Um, I, sorry, if it's confusing, this is imagining that n is continuous, which it obviously isn't, but this is kind of the shape of what's happening. 
Um, for n is greater than four, we have n squared minus four n plus three over n squared plus one. Uh, that's greater than or equal to four uh, n because I'm just substituting one of these n's with four. Minus four n, these cancel. Plus three over n squared plus one. Could you zoom out on that? Uh, yeah, okay, I'll zoom out on this once, once we finish with this question. That's fine. Um, and that is an awful three. Um, this is greater than zero. Um, so because any values greater than it, uh, than four, n equals four are positive, uh, we can look for the infimum only in the bottom. And the infimum of a finite set here, which is just these first four values, is the minimum. So this implies that the infimum of x, I think it was called, uh, is equal to the minimum of the set, which is minus a fifth. And we get that for n equals two. And that's that question complete. So um, for someone who missed that, uh, um, have you got that? No, I'm not sure if you can read it. Uh, if you put it in the chat, if you want me to scroll through it again, possibly a bit bigger. Okay, that's good. Thank you. Um, okay, great. So um, just the last couple of bits, I'm going to go over um, at, at the very end what we're doing in the next uh, sessions. Um, if you... If you would be able to, it would be really useful if you could um, scan this and do feedback on the session. Um, it's useful for me because uh, depending on the feedback, it affects how much I get paid for this. Um, so, and it also helps us to improve the sessions and see what went well and what went wrong. So um, yeah, I would really appreciate if you could do that. I'll leave this on the screen for a little bit and then we'll get through to what the next sessions are on. Um, yeah, was there any questions as we wrap things up about any of the, uh, the no, someone didn't have a chance to ask during the session that someone wants to put on now? Uh, sorry if I missed anyone's questions. I think I got most of them, but my Zoom chat wasn't up the entire time, so. No, that was no extra questions. Um, yeah, oh, with the feedback, you will have to um, log in with whatever you used to um, join this, but yeah, please do if you can. Um, why did you decide to Oh, um, someone asked a question, good question. Uh, why did you decide to value, put values of n into it? Um, oftentimes, if you're um, confused with a question, uh, if you're trying to show um, a question like that, your player round with a couple of values first to see what's happening. Um, the reason, if you didn't decide to do that straight away, um, you might find that the minus 4n kind of got in the way. So if you uh, got, if you went for greater than 4n, you had something bounded it and then you just need to check all the values below that. Um, yeah, I hope that answers that. Um, for the next sessions, um, uh, they'll be paid and there is a discount code um, someone gave me. It's just uh, Team Jamie, I see put. Um, oh, that's a direct message to someone, apologies. Uh, that's discount code for the next sessions. Um, and on Monday the 3rd, we'll be kind of looking at mainly section two um, and we'll go over, it will run from 10 till four, there'll be a break between uh, 12 and one and we'll cover yeah limits um, of sequences and particularly finding limits and what properties they have we'll briefly look at the log and exponential properties and then we'll try and spend most of our time looking at uh, bolzano weistrass as well as uh, lim soup and limit um yes i believe i think this one was recorded um but um, I'll have to check. If you ask in the WhatsApp group, I'll find out for you whether these uh, later ones are recorded. Um, but I think it's it's definitely more useful if you're able to turn up. But if you're not, I'll uh, put it in the WhatsApp group and we'll find out. Um, and then, yeah, we'll also cover um, 
Cauchy sequences. Um, and the difference between the paid one, other than it being much longer and kind of cover, will cover all the questions, all, all the material you'll need for the exam. Uh, it will be a smaller group, which means that in the WhatsApp groups you'll have, it will uh, cover more. Uh, I'll be able to answer everyone's questions there. Um, yeah, th thanks for coming along. Um, I hope this helps out with your with your question with your for a collection exam and good luck with it. And um, yeah, have a nice day. Other than that, I hope to see lots of people on the third. Um, did I cover what was in? Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, in, I didn't cover what was in session three, which will run on the Wednesday. Um, we'll mainly spend this time doing exam questions, but we'll also do most of topic three with different um, looking at different series and testing for convergence and absolute convergence um, and spend the rest of the time going over as many exam questions as we can. So thank you for coming along and yeah, hopefully see lots of you on when on Monday. Thanks.